There is a name. I love to hear. It soothes my doubts and calms all my fears. And as I journey to and fro, I'll take the name wherever I go. <laughs> yes, sir. In Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 24, is a third of the miracles of Jesus which have been described by some as being beyond the possible. This story is probably a familiar but a favorite for some of you who are here. Mark 5, beginning at verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around Jesus. And there was a woman there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak because she thought if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? <laughs> you see the people crowded against you as disciples, and, and you, you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened in her, came and fell at Jesus' feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is the word of God. You may be seated. This is a story about the touch of Jesus. If you need to tag this text, that might be one way that you could do it. Simply say the touch of Jesus. Over the last year, there have been some accidents that have happened in some of our major metropolises. Just recently, in Chicago, a window washer fell to his death. Months before that in New York, a crane blown by a rogue wind snapped and fell to the ground. Thankfully, no one, I think, in that incident was killed. It made me think about an incident in May of 1985, Bridget Gurney, was walking down the street of Manhattan when she was struck by the debris and a crane that had fallen pinning her to the ground. She panicked, of course, and she waited there believing that there was no way out 
And one of the firefighters and police officers, Paul Reganez, came and knelt while the emergency workers were trying to free her from this 35 ton piece of debris, parts of it, not the tonnage, had pinned her down. She accredited her word of hope, her message of survival to Officer Paul by saying he did something. He didn't just talk to me, he touched me. And there was something about the way that he touched my hand and talked to me that I really believed that things would work out, and they did. And she accredits that much to the officer's words, but also to his touch. We know about touching. There are different types of touches that we experience through life. Some touches are on the functional, professional level where we are touched. Other times there are the social polite touches. Turn to your neighbor, we might say, in a room like this and say, you know, greet one another on a social polite level. Or that might be even in this space that when we see someone, we recognize that it becomes a friendship warmth touch. And still other times there may be something loving and intimate in the way that we touch each other. And of course, one of the deepest expressions of love are in those quiet moments where we touch our beloved. Touching, very much part of who we are and who helps us to be our better selves. Pastor Patterson at Mount Corinth would say to the congregation, at what he described, the visitor's courtesy hour, he would say, touch, and he would say, there's therapy in touch. And some of us know that to be true, that there is therapy when the right people touch us. Here's a story of a woman, and touching is very much part of understanding what happens in this story. Quickly, for those of you who have been reading along in the Gospel of Mark, this story is one of several stories that speaks of the miracles of Jesus. The Jesus' power over nature when he quiets a storm. Jesus' power over demons when he heals a demoniac man. Jesus' power over death. We'll talk about it next Sunday. But today, this power over desperation, over disease, is this woman. Her story is interesting because it's couched between another story. Again, that's next Sunday. But in this case, there's a description of the condition of the person involved in this story. We know her, many of us, may be new to some of you as a woman with an issue of blood. This is the description of her condition. Her disease is 12 years old. That's a long time to battle with anything. 4,380 days and nights sunrises and sunsets. That's a long time to be sick. And it's a longer time, not only in sickness, but to go from doctor to doctor. If you have not been there yet, count yourself fortunate. As some of us, that understand what it means to go to the general physician, to the cardiologist, to the oncologist, and then you just keep adding on. That was her situation. It's not to be treated trivially. This is not 
to be told in a way to try to arouse the emotion of people. This is a real woman with a real condition who is speaking to us today and her life has been preserved to celebrate one that is able in his touch to bring power to make meaning in our very lives. She had tried doctors, which means that these doctors had prescribed different medications and sometimes formula of rituals. The time does not permit this morning to go into them, but some of these rituals that had been performed were strange rituals, borderline profane, some of them. And she tried all of them because Desperate times. Yes, it does. Requires desperate measures. I would never do that. Well, maybe not if you're in your condition. But if you're in her condition, you'll try anything to be freed from this condition. And to give more meaning to what happened, you not only see the description of it, but... but in her desperation, she spends everything that she has trying to get healed. So now you got a woman who's diseased and, and destitute. So she's tried everything physically, she's tried everything emotionally and now financially. And sometimes, Life has to get us to a point that after we try everything, we turn to try the best thing. <laughs> hey, this is not one of these stories that's a proof text for us to, again, use and abuse ourselves or others. That's just the truth. People will try almost everything before they really try God. I, I've seen it. And I'll just leave it at that. I've seen it. Her condition leads her that she heard that Jesus had come to town. Remember now, Jesus is just taking a boat ride back on this side of the city. He's been over in the resort town of Gadara. Now he's come back. And when he gets there, he's still at the peak of his popularity. Crowds of people come around him and people just lean in to hear what he has to say and this woman had heard that Jesus was in town and she heard that if she get close enough to him, Jesus could make a difference. Now, now this, is, this is heavy duty stuff. This is a woman in a patriarchal culture. This is a woman in dominant masculinity. This is a woman, how dare her even imagine and now go on record if I could touch a man, a man of his stature, Jesus' stature, of his religiosity, that means she would have to cross the line Religiously, she would have to cross the line. Culturally, she would have to break down barriers in order to touch Jesus. See, today, because there is so much accessibility, this doesn't care to wait for some people, but imagine being a member of a convention where you have served God as a woman in ministry, Singing, preaching, 
a local congregation call you the pastor, and then you get into a room full of men that tell a woman that she can't be what God has called her to be. Then you begin to kind of, sort of, and, and the only reason why you don't clap is because you got a lot of men here that don't believe women ought to have that kind of role and accessibility. Tell your mama that. Because mama has been one of the best pastors and preachers and priestess that you have ever encountered in your life. The same way you have problems with it, that's the problem with this text. You've been taught women shouldn't have a place to do this. It's in our tradition, it's in our cultural DNA. Then you begin to understand the gravity of what's happening here. If you just hear it the way that you've heard it all of your life and just say, well, there's a woman who was sick. There's a lot more going on in this. So here's this woman who is sick and she's tried every doctor. And now she's at her last resort. If I can touch, how dare you? In fact, how dare Mark write that down? And, and Peter showed no better because Peter is the one that's telling Mark what to write down. And Peter, here Peter is, said, now Mark, don't forget this story. Tell that story. And he's writing down and said, do you know the stir that this would generate in a church when they start really reading it now, if they just read it and say, this is a miracle on the surface of a woman that's sick and she's healed, then we're safe. But if you start telling this story, and then in order for this woman to touch, you say, no, 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 she can't talk like that. You can't talk about touching Jesus. That's man business. And that's what she said. Because she had heard. And how does faith come to you? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God. She had heard what Jesus had done. And she believed the report. She actually believed that if Jesus could do this for a man living in the cemetery full of demons, Certainly he can help somebody like me that has a biological and physiological disorder. If I could but touch King James, the hem of his garment. And, and, and there Jesus is, and I'm done with the sermon. And there Jesus is. In the middle of this crowd, and this lady is... Just use your imagination. You can, you can have as much fun with it as you want to. That in the middle of this crowd, King James works it this way. He said, pressed her way. <laughs> Sometimes we'll have altar call and, and, and I'll just say, press your way. She, she elbowed, maneuvered her weight around. She's a diminutive woman. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's probably pale and faint and weak, but she's strong enough to say, if I can just get, I don't have to touch him. If I can touch what's on him, that'll, do, that, that'll work for me. I don't know where she was. But at the hymn, she's probably now trying to crawl away. In the lowest position that she can get. 
to reach and just touch. Now, 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 before she touches him, a lot of folk have been touching Jesus. Some were touching him out of curiosity. They just wanted to know, is he real? Or is there some aberration before us? Is, is he, da, 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 I mean, is he flesh and blood? So out of curiosity, some inadvertently touched him. They bumped him to him and said, excuse me, some touched him religiously. But this woman had intentionality. She says, I'm sick and I need a doctor that is able to make me well. And I heard that he is a divine physician. And when she touched the hem of his garment, Mark uses a word repeatedly where he says immediately she is healed and as soon as she touched Jesus, Jesus then responded and said, who touched me? <laughs> you, you, ought, you, ought to, you ought to show up some Sunday mornings with a made up mind that I came here on purpose this morning to touch Jesus. You ought to say that sometimes. You ought to say, I got up this morning. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Walking and talking with my mind stayed on Jesus. What did you come here for? To touch him. Who touched me? And, and the Deacon family ministry didn't mean any harm. They said, now, Lord, with all these people in there, you know somebody touched you. He said, no, no, no. He said, Derek, I, I know. I, I, didn't, I, I wasn't saying who ran into me. Uh, uh, who, who, who bumped into me. And then uh, Edwin said, now, Lord, Lord, now, we've been around you a long time. You know how people say, I understand that. I, I got that. And they say, but, but now, whoever this person is, they touch me with purpose. This was a touch of trust. This was somebody that trusted that I was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all what they could ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. And, and when nobody can answer, nobody can answer, this woman, and I'm done, steps out with a confession and simply says, it was me. It, it was me. Jesus said, that's all I've been wanting this morning was somebody that after I have touched them to say, it was me. It was me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, not my sister, not my brother, but me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And, and that's what confession does. That's what confession does. Confession changes the room. You know, if we wanted to on Sunday morning, we could just simply say, go on your phone, and for those of you that want to unite with the church, just log in and we'll call you. We, we did that uh, for years. I remember in our church, it was uh, at a point where you didn't have anywhere to sit down. We would just give a card out and say, reach in the back of the seat and and fill that out if you want to join because you, could, you couldn't move. But, but it doesn't take the place of public confession. The, the reason why we do what we do publicly is because it's hard to unbind what has been bound in the public. That's why when we marry, normally, normally, our ceremony is before witnesses. Because when you say, I do, and you say, I promise to love and honor and cherish in sickness and in health and richness and poverty and all of that, that we do it before people so that when we say, I'm out of here, 
because they sick. You said, but you said in sickness and in health. That, 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 that's what we do. You say, well, 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 he broke now. She ain't got nothing no more. Say, but you said in richness and in poverty. You don't break the bond that you publicly confessed because things have gone bad. That's when you come together more and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And if we believe it, the Lord can deliver us. Have a good day, but God bless you real good. But you know just what I'm talking about. You go to to go to the ward where babies have been born. And I can tell you what you do. I've stood with these parents. These are the days when you would call the pastor and say, uh, my wife has given birth to our first child. And you go to the hospital. And then mama could be behind that glass and would hold up that baby. But let me tell you what I ain't never heard no parent say. Ooh, don't show that baby to nobody. You don't care what the situation is, your confession is, that's my baby. And the same way we say that about our children, the same we say that about our babies, it ought to be the same way that we said about our faith that that's my Jesus over there. We ought to tell somebody what the Lord had done for us. You don't have to get loud about it. You ought to every now and then when you're sitting around the table just start talking about how good the Lord had been. Do you remember when you weren't able to buy a house, when you couldn't afford a new car, when you couldn't move where you wanted to go, or you couldn't take a piece of a vacation, but now the Lord has given you benefits, and now the Lord has given you extra. You ought to tell him, I'm not bragging about it. I'm just testifying that the Lord is good. How I got a witness here. Now y'all know I didn't mean to go this far, but my soul is out there. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he done for me, Victory. Now let me ask you one question. Do you have anything to rejoice about? I didn't ask you to run to nowhere. I didn't ask you to turn to nobody. I just said, do you have something to thank God for? Well, why don't you, however you do it, it may be with the clap of a hand. It may be waving your hand. It may be running. It may be shouting. But let the redeem of the Lord say so.
come on. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit to change our lives in order to change the lives of the world or the communities that we live in. Mm. Help us never to be ashamed regardless of our credentials, our position, to take a time out to simply say, Lord, thank you. During this season of Thanksgiving, families are preparing right now to gather in a couple of weeks. Help us to spend a few minutes in a world that is almost well, have dismissed Thanksgiving, skipped over it to get to Christmas. Help us to just pause for a few minutes to say, what do you have to be thankful for? Now give us a heart of gratitude to say thank you for what you've done in our life. In the name of Jesus. That those who are here who have made that way to worship this morning that need Christ, need the church, need to be committed to his kingdom cause without debate, discussion, negotiation, would you move upon them for them to get up and come forward and let today be a day in which they begin brand new in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray and for his sake and all God's people say together, amen. amen. Give God praise today.